Hi everyone, Dr. Dave Richardson. I'm going to be your instructor for today's webinar, which is entitled Medra Coding Basics. Assisting me today is Sarah Clark, who's one of the training coordinators with the MSSO. Today's webinar is scheduled for a two hour segment. I've taught this webinar many times in the past. I try to make sure that all the information that I give you is valuable information, and I will be sharing a lot of information with you. So if you are very new to Medra, I don't expect you'll be able to digest all of this information in one sitting. So that is why we record the session in the event that you want to listen to it at some point in the future. And similarly, if because of questions, et cetera, we run, run over that two hour period, again, it's being recorded for you to be able to listen to it at a future time in the event that you have to be off the call promptly after two hours. So I'm gonna to try to keep this very, very focused. My intention here is to give you basics about how to use Measure for Coding. And in doing so, I will assume that you have little experience with Medra and give a lot of introductory material. If in fact you find that the pace or the material that we are covering today is too basic for you, we also have an advanced coding webinar, which may be of greater benefit for you if you've had more experience with Medra as well. A couple of other housekeeping things. We are going to be using the Poll EV application, which will allow you to interact with me in terms of providing answers to questions that I'm going to ask you later in the webinar. And the other point as well is that we are going to make use of the Medra browser, which you will need to have access to, and the information on how to access the browser was in the chat pane as well. Now the chat pane is going to be the mechanism by which you submit questions to me. And in fact, you will type in those questions and at the end of the session, uh, I will ask Sarah if we've collected any questions and I will stay on trying to answer all those questions or direct them to other individuals within the MSSO if needed to get the answers to your questions. One last thing that I just want to clarify for those of you who are holding on the line with the idea that at the end during questions and answers that I'm going to answer any specific questions about verbatim reports that you have, I'm not going to be able to do that and I don't intend to do that. And that is because I firmly believe and emphasize this in all of my courses that proper coding involves the context of understanding your drug, everything about it, your label, your regulatory environment, your coding conventions, et cetera. So any attempt for me to try to off the cuff point you to the absolute correct answer without that context is not a good idea on my part and probably not a good idea for you to use such an opinion for something as important as accurately capturing information about your product. So without any further ado, let me move forward with today's presentation. So again, introducing myself, I'm Dave Richardson. I'm, I'm a physician by training, specifically an adult neurologist. And I have been a medical officer with the MSSO for about 10 years now. Now, this is to remind me to tell you that Medra is owned by ICH. And because it is a living and breathing terminology that needs to be constantly maintained, ICH has created an organization called the Medra Maintenance and Support Services Organization, or MSSO, which is responsible for the ongoing maintenance and training in Medra. The activities of the MSSO are overseen by a Medra Management Committee, which is made up of ICH parties, MHRA, Health Canada, World Health Organization as an observer. This slide has three bullets, which I'll summarize as follows. The first bullet is to remind me to tell you that this is copyrighted material. And with the exception of the Medra and ICH logos, you can feel free to use the material in these slides in public presentations, as long as you acknowledge that ICH owns the copyright. However, if you modify the information in this presentation in any way, shape or form, you should not imply or infer that ICH either supports or endorses the changes that you've made. The second bullet is legal language and therefore I will read it verbatim. The presentation is provided as it is without warranty of any kind. 
in no event shall the ICH or the authors of the original presentation be liable for any claim, damages, or other liability arising from the use of the presentation. And the third bullet refers to third party slides. And since we don't have any in today's presentation, I'll skip over that last bullet. But here's what we're going to cover in today's webinar. We're going to gain some knowledge about METRA's scope, its structure and its characteristics. We're gonna talk about coding conventions, which are the written rules that one might use in determining how you decide what is the proper METRA term for coding purposes. We're going to learn a lot about a very important document called the Medra Term Selection Points to Consider document, or PTC as we call it. This PTC document is very helpful in providing ICH endorsed guidance on how one goes about selecting appropriate Medra terms for coding purposes. We're going to also learn about the Medra browsers. I'm going to do a demonstration of the browser for you, as well as do multiple coding examples where you will be able to see how I use the browser to come to the recommended response for the verbatims that I will present to you. And then you will use the browser at the end of the webinar to give me some ideas about what you think would be the proper way to code five different verbatims that I'm going to present. And you will communicate those responses to me using the poll eb application so in order to use poll eb as described in the chat box there are a few ways to get onto this platform one is to open up a browser on either your computer or your cell phone go to the url polleb.com enter as the username medra174 click join skip the next screen and it will then allow you when questions are presented to be able to put your responses in there. Now, a second way for you to be able to use the Poll EV platform is to access it through this QR code. So for those of you who have your cell phones at the ready, who want to whip this out and scan this, this is another way for you to get access to Poll EV. So I'm going to keep this QR code up for about 10 or 15 seconds and allow you to scan that if that's the way you would prefer to interact with Poll EV. And I will also show this same QR code later in the presentation as well, when it is time for you to actually do some responding with Poll EV. All right, so let's begin with our overview of Medra. So Medra is a clinically validated international terminology that is used by the regulated biopharmaceutical industry, as well as the regulators who regulate the biopharmaceutical industry. And it is a terminology that can be used throughout the entire regulatory process from pre-marketing to post-marketing. And it involves multiple functionalities in terms of the way that measure can be used. Most importantly, however, for purposes of our discussion today is data entry which is a synonym for coding, where you get a report and decide which measure term you would like to code and capture in your database. But once you have filled a database with measure coded data, it is also then appropriate in the future to be able to retrieve that information, evaluate that information, analyze that information, and maybe even present it. And these are other uses of measure that are talked about in other webinars that we present as well not only data analysis, but query building, et cetera. So let's move forward then. Let's start out by talking about where Medra is used. And we have this nice rectangle here that begins with clinical product development in clinical phase one, where we take a product and we expose normal healthy volunteers to it. And then going forward through the progression, we do trials, Presumably, that would be placebo controlled trials with larger numbers of patients of interest, and then move on to phase three, which is even larger numbers of patients in controlled trials. And if one is absolutely clear on a presentation of their data, and the data suggests that the drug is reasonably safe and efficacious by whatever standard the regulatory agency is using then you will end up with a situation where you could have a marketed product. And in any of those phases, 
the use of measure would be used to capture important concepts that you would want to database. Now, I also would like to point out that there are things that are done on the preclinical side with animal models in which measure falls outside of that scope in that it is not the recommended terminology for coding events or situations in preclinical. I'm not on the preclinical side, so I wouldn't make a specific recommendation about what you might use, but just keep focused on the fact that METRA is in play through phases one through four in a number of ways, including databases, use of METRA terms in safety summaries and various kinds of reports, the investigator brochure that you develop early in clinical development when you're trying to instruct your investigators as to what you know about the drug. And early on, your IB, as it is called, might be very brief because you don't know much about your new chemical entity. But as you begin to do more controlled studies and certainly begin to accumulate safety information, then the investigator brochure will be expanded to include this additional information. Other places where you would see measure used are in CCSIs, in marketing applications, publications. How about even in the prescribing information that is provided to healthcare providers that instruct you on how to use the product? And then the last one is something that is very unique to the United States, which is that when you watch television at night, we have commercials on TV where you have advertising for prescription drugs, and there are measure terms used in those advertisements as well. Now, this is a crucial slide that I'm going to spend several minutes talking about. In my experience, when people complain about measure not doing a good job with something, Nine out of 10 times, it's because they are asking Medra to do something that it wasn't intended to do. So it is very important for you to understand what is within the scope of Medra so that you are not disappointed or disillusioned when Medra doesn't do something that it wasn't intended to do. So we have this nice blue circle, and inside of that circle are things that are within the scope of Medra. But I would rather start this discussion by going outside of that circle to show you things that are not in the scope of measure. The first concept here is not a drug dictionary. So if you want a drug dictionary, then you will need to use something like WhoDrug. It is also not an equipment, device, or diagnostic product dictionary. And there are other dictionaries that would fill in those voids. Medra does not have a lot of demographic terms unless it adds some clinical importance in the concept that is being added to Medra. For instance, there is a Medra term for male breast cancer and female breast cancer because those cancers may be different in terms of the pathology, in terms of the etiology, and maybe even in terms of the response to treatment. And similarly, there are certain vulnerable populations like pregnant women, young babies, newborns and infants, or the elderly who are vulnerable populations where sometimes measure will have qualifying terms describing one of those vulnerable populations. So demographics are not commonly used, but can be used in situations where they add value to a concept. Now, this one here points out that measure does not have a lot of clinical trial design terms in it. And that's because many people that use measure are not involved in clinical development. They may be social scientists or researchers using it for some other issue, or it may be used on the post-marketing side where clinical trials have long ago been performed with the product. So you're not going to see things like double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover types of terms in measure. METRA also does not pay attention very much to the frequency of an event. And if that's important to you, then you need to capture that information by some other mechanism. For instance, METRA has a term for headache, but METRA does not have a term for 12 headaches or nine headaches or seven headaches. So if quantifying how many times an event has occurred is important information, then you will have to have some other vehicle in your data collection instrument to capture that information. Now, numerical values for results. Measure shies away from numerical values and tends to have qualitative 
information such as concepts like normal, abnormal, high, low, increased, decreased. Because the problem with numerical values when um, presenting investigation information is that sometimes laboratories can use different scales for a particular test. So one lab may have a range for serum potassium that's slightly different than the laboratory down the street. And sometimes a laboratory can be measured by more than one standard. So when we look at glucose, for instance, in the United States, it is measured in milligrams per deciliter, whereas in Europe, it might be measured in millimoles per liter. So Metra stays out of that by trying to stay out of the quantitative business and focusing more on the qualitative presentation of concepts. And the last one we're gonna talk about outside of the scope are severity descriptors. If you take a case of rheumatoid arthritis and show it to, show that patient to five different rheumatologists, you might get their differing opinions on how severe a case that is, whether it's mild or moderate or severe, because these are subjective determinations and Medra stays out of that. Instead, if you care about following the progression of something like a cancer or a neurodegenerative disease, then you need to use a standardized measurement scale for that purpose, because Medra is not designed to do that. So basically, when someone says to me, Medra does a lousy job of allowing me to track the progression of a cancer, it's because that's what, not what Medra is designed to do. And you'll need to find an alternate scale or classification to do that for you. So these are the things that are outside the scope. Now let's go inside the scope. Well, obviously, most people know that Medra can be used to code medical conditions like diseases and disorders, signs and symptoms. But depending upon how you're using Medra, what the regulatory requirements are and where you are in the development of your product, you might be using Medra as well for coding the indications for use of a drug to code investigations, not only the tests themselves, but the results, various kinds of procedures, including medical and surgical procedures, and various kinds of history, including medical history, social history, and family history. So these five are all focused on the patient or subject. And the remaining ones tend to focus on the product or how the product is used and can include such concepts as medication errors. A medication is not administered or used properly. Product quality issues. For instance, you open up a bottle of pills and in the bottom of the bottle of pills are slivers of medicine, or excuse me, slivers of metal. That is a potential manufacturing issue that is a product quality issue. And in fact, if the patient unknowingly ingests some of those metal slivers and becomes ill, that product quality issue could also be associated with a codable medical condition. Excuse me, you get a drink of water. Okay, so other things include device-related concepts, which are in measure hundreds of device-related concepts, product use issues, pharmacogenetic terms, in the good old days, if you opened up the physician desk reference, which is the book that told physicians how to prescribe a drug, what this would typically say is start the patient at a particular dose, increase it by a certain number of milligrams every week or two weeks until they either get better or they have an intolerable side effect. But nowadays, because we so clearly know much more about genetics and individual genomes, it may be that when you go to use a drug, it will ask you to make some determinations about that individual patient. For instance, there are certain enzymes or cytochromes as they're called in the liver that metabolize drugs. And so you may look at the prescribing instructions that will say, first thing you should do before prescribing this drug is to determine whether this person is a fast or slow CYP3A4 metabolizer. That's one of those enzymes. If they are a fast metabolizer, start them with 100 milligrams of drug. If they're a slow metabolizer, start them with only 25 milligrams of drug. So you'll see these pharmacogenetic terms in Metra as well. And also you will see toxicologic issues, 
as well as standardized queries, which are called the standardized measure queries, which are built into the measure platform itself. Okay. So that's an important slide for you to have familiarity with. Now, this slide is a crucial slide because it's going through the actual structure of Medra. Medra is a hierarchy of terms organized in five levels. And here are the five levels of Medra. The top level are the system organ classes, which are called SOCs, high level group terms, which are HLGTs, below those high level terms, which are HLTs, the preferred terms, which are medical concepts or PTs, and at the bottom are the lowest level terms or LLTs. Now you will see that as we go down the five levels of Medra, the number of terms at each level increases. So we go from 27 SOX to a little over 300 HLGTs, to 1,700 HLTs, to 26,000 PTs, to almost 87,000 LLTs. And these are all based upon Medra version 26.0. Now, this is important because you get more granularity and more specificity as you go down the Medra hierarchy. Now, when we are talking about coding, we are firmly focused on this lowest level, the lowest level terms, because your job when coding verbatim information that is presented to you is to try to identify which of the 87,000 terms in Medra are most appropriate for you to use to code that concept of interest. So today we will be firmly focused on the LLT level because that's where you're going to find the measure terms that you use for coding. But while we're looking at the hierarchy on this slide, I wanna make a couple of other comments. One comment is that most times when you go to analyze data in Medra, people will look at data based upon the system organ classes and the preferred terms or medical concepts. So it's important to know that when we're talking about coding, we're looking at LLTs, but most times when we are talking about data analysis, we're looking at PTs. The other point that I would like to make on this slide is at the PT level and above in Medra, Medra uses proper British English. So in fact, if you are looking for a term in Medra at any of these four levels, and it has the word fetal in it, you will need to know that there needs to be an O in that, or using an O in a demur, or using an A before the E in hemorrhage. Because many times when people cannot find a term at these four levels, it's because it could be a British spelling and they're not accustomed to it. Whereas at the lowest level in measure, you will see the British English spelling as well as the American English spelling at the LLT level within Medra. So let's go through this five level hierarchy in a little bit more detail, starting at the very top with the system organ classes. Here are the 27 socks laid out alphabetically in American English. Now, for those of you who have a clinical background, you will note that many of these socks are the actual organ classes that you would examine in examining a patient or taking their history. So you might do an exam of the cardiac system or examination of the eye or of the musculoskeletal system or of the nervous system. But in fact, also notice that Medra has socks that are unique to Medra, including the sock for injury, poisoning, and procedural complications, the one for things like product issues, the one for social circumstances, et cetera. So there's no two ways around this. Your ability to be any good with Medra is going to be directly related to how much you know about Medra, how much familiarity you have with the 27 socks and what's in them. And I'm not suggesting that you need to have a cyclopedic in an encyclopedic mastery of the terms in Medra, but you do need to know that there are terms related to endocrine, for instance, or respiratory, have some idea of what's in Medra, especially these unique socks in Medra, 
like social circumstances and general disorders and administration site conditions, which don't necessarily correlate with a single organ system. The other thing I would say in looking at this is don't fall into the trap that people fall into sometimes, which is to think that they only need to know a limited amount about Medra. You may have a drug, one drug that you develop for depression, and you may be under the, the misinformation that the only thing you need to know about Medra are things in the psychiatric disorders side. But suppose your antidepressant causes some problem with heart rhythm or causes some nervous system problem. You need to know about these other socks because you may need to code side effects. I believe is the only important sock for your particular product. So the more you know about Medra and what's in it and what the socks cover, the better you're going to be at using the product. And because we are constantly updating Medra, you need to be aware of the fact that every six months or so, somewhere around 1,500 new terms typically are added to Medra. So those new terms are something that you might want to be acquainted with because they may help you with a coding problem that you had previously that now has been resolved because additional LLTs have been added. So let's look at the five levels of Medra in one specific sock. Let's look at the sock for cardiac disorders. Beneath the sock level, you have the HLGTs. So thinking about this, we have cardiac disorders. And at the HLGT level, we have the large basket of kinds of disorders that you can have. So in the actual sock itself, I think there are 15, 12 or 15 different HLGTs. I can't have every single one on this slide just from the point of view of space, but I have put one down here, which is cardiac arrhythmias. Now, similarly, there would be an HLGT for things like myocardial problems or pericardial problems or valve problems. Those would be other buckets or other HLGTs. So we're focusing now on the HLG for cardiac arrhythmias. And if we go down one level to the HLDs, HLT level, there are going to be multiple buckets for various kinds of arrhythmias. And one of them is the one for rate and rhythm disorders, not elsewhere classified. Now, if we go below the HLTs, we get to the medical concept level, which multiple PTs is usually under an HLT. And in this case, one of the PTs is arrhythmia. And finally below that are LLTs and we have these LLTs underneath the PT of arrhythmia. Now, if I show you any of the PTs that are in Medra and ask you to predict at least one of the LLTs that's going to be underneath that PT, it's going to be the PT itself. So we have arrhythmia at the PT level, and we have arrhythmia as an LLT that can be used for coding. But we have some others as well, including this one for arrhythmia, not otherwise specified. These are terms that were added originally to measure when there was no specificity given about the nature of the arrhythmia. So when you had those kinds of cases, this would have been a term that you might have used where it simply said unspecified arrhythmia. We don't add those NOS terms anymore to measure. We try to be very specific about the LLTs that we have, but I want you to just know that they're in measure and have to remain in measure because once we put a term in measure, we never remove it. Another LLT is dysrhythmias, but this one above it is the interesting one. This one is in red. It is other specified cardiac dysrhythmias. And it is in red literally because it is made non-current. And non-currency means it is flagged in red in the measure browser to tell tell you that a conscious decision has been made to make that LLT non-current, and it means that you should not, I repeat, should not use that LLT again for clean purposes going. So let's talk a little bit more about this non-currency. Literally, the LLT is going to be in red with a red box around it in the measure browser, and you'll see that when I open the browser up. So non-current terms are flagged at the LLT level. 
They are flagged to communicate you, to you the recommendation that you should not use them for coding going forward. And the reason is because we will have added one or more new LLTs that we think provide greater specificity than that LLT than we, that we have made not current. But these non-current LLTs will remain in Medra because if you want to do any kind of retrospective analysis, looking back at your data from five years ago or eight years ago, you need to have available to you in that retrospective skips or view all of the LLTs that you could possibly have used for coding. Now, you may ask the question, what terrible crime does an LLT have to commit in order for us at the, at the MSSO to make it non-current? Well, sometimes it's made non-current because it is vague, because the concept is outdated, because the term is truncated, or maybe sometimes it's misspelled, or sometimes the term comes from other terminologies that do not fit measure rules, and therefore the term is non-current because it does not match well with measure rules. But I did leave out this one because this one is particularly important. A good reason why an LLT would be made non-current is because it is ambiguous or subject to multiple interpretations. And once you have terms that have multiple interpretations, it becomes very difficult to, to know which interpretation to use when coding. So we generally try to have as little ambiguity in MEDRA as possible. So let's give an example of ambiguity. Here are the letters I and O standing on the road. They see X and L coming down the road. And one letter says, if they're Latin, they're consonants. If they're Roman, they're the number 40. And the other, the, the other letter says, maybe they're from the garment district, as in extra large. So what does XL stand for? It all depends upon the context. And that's why the abbreviation XL is ambiguous and would be the kind of term that we would not want to continue to have you use for coding because it can have variable interpretations. So let's think about that in a practical sense in terms of something you may come across. Here is a question that I'm going to pose to you. How would you code the following verbatim? The verbatim report says, patient had MI. Patient had MI. Now, I'm going to open up poll EV, which is going to allow you to now type in any types of responses that you think you might use. How would you have coded this concept of patient had MI? Let's see what kind of responses we get here. So someone says myocardial infarction. It looks like that's the response that most of you might choose. Let's give it a minute to see a few things here. Again, infarct. Now here's the point. Most of you, when I ask this question, typically say, oh, well, it's a myocardial infarction. And you're absolutely correct except when you're wrong. And you're wrong here, because if you get a report that says patient had MI, there is nothing about that statement, the context of that statement, that tells you what MI stands for. In fact, even if that report came from a cardiologist, MI could mean myocardial infarction, but could also mean mitral insufficiency. And if that report came from a psychiatrist, it could stand for mental illness. And if it came from a vascular surgeon, it could be mesenteric ischemia. So the whole point here is that an, amb an ambiguous abbreviation is problematic. And in fact, that would not be an, a in measure that you could use. It would be flagged as non-current. And we'll see that when we go into the browser. Now, in addition to the words that you see in measure, each term in MEDRA is also 
assign a unique eight digit number. So in fact, this PT anemia in measure, again, spelled with proper British English, because it's at the PT level, has a code of 10002034. Now, this is a non-expressive code. And what I mean by that is nothing about those numbers or the order of those numbers allows you to predict whether the term is a cardiovascular term, a neurologic term, a respiratory term, a social circumstances term. The reason is because when we need to assign a new number, we just take the next available number. And that's why there's no hidden meaning in the eight digit assignments. However, these codes allow you to be able to submit data electronically using a new field, which would be numerical codes. And this might also be a valuable way for you to communicate with colleagues who in fact are not clinicians, for instance, your data managers or biostatisticians, providing them with codes like this with numbers may allow them to search or query your database, not needing to know anything about the medical concepts, just finding matches for that eight digit code within a database. So it's another way of communicating about Medra. Now, I'm showing this slide just to point out that many of you know we're in the midst of an aggressive plan here in the next two years to complete an ambitious translation of the Medra browser into many more languages than were previously available. And the point of this is to provide our users with working copies of the browser in languages that they are most comfortable and facile in using. So we have here the, the Medra code 10019211, which is the Medra code for headache. And this representation in all of these languages of 10019211 is always going to point to the concept of headache. However, that is translated into the various languages. So we continue to add new Medra translations of the browser. And which I would suggest that you just be on the lookout for emails that will come from us every time a new translation is added and available for our users. Now, here's an important concept when we are talking about PTs or medical concepts in measure, which is the concept of multi-axiality. And to introduce this, I want to use a quote from Sir William Osler, who was considered one of the fathers of modern medicine. And William Osler said, he who knows syphilis knows medicine. What did he mean by that? Well, syphilis was a disease that was widespread and easily transmitted during his time. And what was also very, very difficult about syphilis is that it could affect almost any tissue or organ in the body. It could affect the heart or the lungs or the kidneys. So what in fact he was saying is, if you had a good mastery of syphilis and how it affected the body, you probably had a good understanding of medicine because all parts of the living organism might be affected by that particular disorder. And so probably the best equivalent in modern thinking would be something like HIV, where if I said to you, what organ system is affected by HIV, you would say, well, there is no one system. It could affect multiple systems. And so because that is true, we can have a medical concept of PT in Medra that can be found in multiple socks because that makes sense because there is no one sock that describes all the various manifestations and the various ways that that concept might lie within the 27 socks of the Medra terminology. So when we have these PTs that are multi-axial, meaning that they're in more than one sock, and in fact, it is over 40% of PTs that are multi-axial. So this is not a trivial point that I'm making. It's a significant number of the PTs, over 40% are multi-axial. These PTs that are represented in more than one sock. This allows us to group by different classifications, and when it comes time for data retrieval and presentation, 
it allows us to identify different data sets. But here's the problem with this. If I have a PT that is in four different socks within Medra, and I look at the number of times that a report is given to me that I databased, and let's say I had four instances of that medical concept that were captured for this particular PT. Let's say the PT was headache and I had four reports of headache. That PT could appear in multiple socks. And what I don't want to do is when I start counting up my cases of headache is to count four the first time I see that PT and then move to another sock and it appears four there as well. And I add that and get eight and then 12 and then 16 and someone says to me how many headaches did you have and i say 16 when the answer is no there were four reports what i got confused about is i looked at each time that pt occurred in medra and it caused me to double or triple or quadruple count that and that is one of the challenges with multi-axial pts that when it comes time for data analysis, we don't want to overcount the number of times an event has occurred. So this is why we need some help here. And the help that is provided by the MSSO is that when a PT is in multiple SOCs, the MSSO will make the determination of which of those SOCs will be considered the primary SOC. And by different definition, any other socks that that PT is in are then considered to be secondary socks. And this provides part of the standardization of measure, this assignment of primary socks, especially when it comes time to present that data. Because as I said to you, most people present their data based upon socks and PTs underneath that sock for which that is the primary sock for that PT. So this is an important idea with multi-axiality, that the determination of primary SOC is made by the MSSO. Now, let's look at an example. Here's the PT influenza. And that medical concept actually appears in two different SOCs, infections and infestations, as well as in respiratory, thoracic, and mediastinal disorders. And the MSSO has made the determination that infections and infestations is the primary sock and therefore by definition respiratory becomes a secondary sock and if that concept appeared in a third and a fourth and a fifth sock those would also be secondary socks as well so there has to be some rule now that we use for determining how to assign the primary sock and these are the rules and the exceptions to the rules. So don't get angry with me, just work with me while we go through this, and this will become clearer as we begin to look at the measure browser. So the first thing is, if a PT appears in only one sock, that's pretty straightforward. By definition, it's only in one sock, that's going to be its primary sock. But if a PT appears in multiple socks, the prime site of manifestation for that disease or sign or symptom is going to be how the primary sock determination is made. So if you were looking at a particular disease, let's call it big man disease, let's just make up a disease, big man disease, and you're reading and it says big man disease affects the heart, the lungs, and the kidneys, but almost all patients will have heart problems. It's telling me that even though this might affect multiple systems, the vast majority of people will have heart issues. And that would be the really reason that when I assign a primary sock to big man disease, it would probably be cardiac disorders because that's the prime manifestation site. Now, having given you those two rules, we then have some exceptions. And here are the three exceptions. When we are talking about congenital and hereditary terms, the primary sock is going to be the sock congenital, familial, and, and genetic disorders. For neoplasm terms, the primary sock is going to be neoplasms, benign, malignant, and unspecified, including cysts and polyps. And for infection and infestation terms, the primary sock is going to be infections and infestations. But if we look at these three exceptions, 
it is conceivable that we have more than one of these concepts in a particular case. For instance, there are certain infections that might predispose you to developing certain neoplasms. For instance, Epstein-Barr virus would predispose you to developing Burkitt's lymphoma, or hepatitis C might predispose you to develop a tumor of the liver. Similarly, there are infections that can be present in a newborn at birth. So you can have a congenital infection. So it is possible for more than one of these three concepts to be relevant in a particular case. And when that happens, we need another rule that helps us to figure out what the pecking order is. So here is the rule. If a PT links to more than one of the exceptions, the following priority is used to determine the primary size, congenital over neoplasm and neoplasm over infection. So when we have all three concepts, two or, the, two or more of these concepts, this is the pecking order that we use to determine primary size. Now, one other thing related to multiaxiality that I would like you to understand. There are three very unique socks. These three right here, investigations, surgical and medical procedures, and social circumstances. And those three socks are unique. They are so-called non-multiaxial, single axial, uniaxial. Those are all terms that are used to basically describe that if you look at any PT in any one of these three socks, the only place you are going to find that PT is in that sock. So the PTs that are in the investigation sock are only found in that sock. Similarly, that's true for PTs in surgical and medical procedures are only found in that sock. And those for social circumstances are only found in that sock. And that has significant implications when it comes time for data analysis, which is part of the discussion, should you take those data analysis and SMQ webinars that we offer. So let's talk a little bit about coding conventions at this point. What are coding conventions? These are written rules, guidances, or sets of principles in this particular case that would help you to know how to use measure for coding in a way that is going to be consistent and help you in terms of consistency in coding, accuracy in coding, and hopefully if you have done a good job of coding, then when you go to retrieve data and analyze data, then hopefully the information will be analyzable because you put the right things in your database. These conventions, when we have them, also help us to exchange information worldwide because if we have conventions for coding and there are standardized conventions that are used, then people tend to code similar cases the same way. And sometimes our coding conventions will help us by helping us deal with some of the practical issues of the verbatims that you might receive. Because your verbatims may have misspellings or abbreviations or acronyms, and your convention may tell you how you want to deal with those. It may tell you how you deal with combination terms and do to terms, which would be a report of something, let's say, fever due to influenza. How does your organization decide or handle those kinds of concepts. And similarly, it may help you decide when you want to query. For instance, if you get a report of chest pain, your coding convention may say always query the site or the reporter because not every chest pain that is reported is cardiac in nature. So you wanna have clarity about that before you just assume that chest pain is always cardiovascular in nature. So why do we need coding conventions? Because coders have varying aptitudes of proficiency. Some coders may have a background in biology or biochemistry. Some may be history majors. The ability to be a good coder means that you simply have a good medical knowledge of that product, the kinds of things that it can do. And therefore, one could not one is not necessarily excluded from being a coder because you don't have a scientific background. What you need to do is have a good mastery of that product, the conventions for that product, the side effects for that product, that leads to quality coding. Now, the other reason that we need conventions is because 
there are concerns about consistency with magic because it has so many choices available to you. And even if you use an autoencoder, which is a software program that's designed to text mine and actually do your coding for you, sometimes your autoencoder will not be able to come up with an answer. And in those kinds of cases, you're going to have to manually code. And if you have to manually code, you need to have conventions of how you go about doing manual coding. Let's think about those autoencoders a little bit, because some of you may actually use them quite frequently in your day-to-day -day work. Sometimes your autoencoder will steer you in the wrong direction. Here we had a verbatim which said allergic to CAT scan, and that got autoencoded to allergic to cats. Now, we think that's funny. We get a good laugh out of it. But in fact, if you had 10 of those cases in your database and your autoencoder coded that incorrectly 10 times and you submit that to a regulatory agency, the quality of your work is immediately going to be under scrutiny because no one is checking to see that the coding makes sense. Here's another example. Myocardial infarction in the fall of 2000 was coded by the autoencoder as myocardial infarction and fall. I think most of you would agree with me that this is referring to a time of year, not an actual physical fall, and potentially creates a problem where you are misrepresenting what is in the verbatim. So we're going to now talk about this important document called the points to consider document for term selection. And the first thing I want to do is show you what this document looks like. This is the cover sheet of the latest version of the PTC for term selection, which was released in March of 2023, along with MEDRA version 26.0. This is ICH endorsed guidance for both industry and regulatory purposes to try to promote accurate and consistent term selection for coding purposes with measure, particularly for sharing such information with regulatory agencies. And in fact, if your organization does not have its own coding conventions, then you have our permission to use the PTC as your coding conventions. But it makes no sense for you to say that we follow the PTC term selection as our coding conventions if you don't do any of the stuff that's within this document. So if you're going to endorse the document, then use the document. It's a great document. It's about 50 plus pages long, but very, very valuable with a lot of examples, and it touches on important coding principles. So a few more things about this PTC. It was developed by a working group of the ICH Management Committee. It is updated annually on March 1st in English to coincide with the late, the complex release of measure that occurs in March of each year. Complete versions of this PTC on term selection are available in English, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and Russian. There are also condensed versions of this PTC document available in Arabic, Brazilian Portuguese, Czech, Dutch, French, German, Hungarian, Italian, and Portuguese. The condensed versions are shorter and stick really to the key principles without as many examples in there, but they're designed to be user-friendly in that it allows people whose native language or the language they're most comfortable is with is one of these. It allows you to be able to look at a condensed presentation of what's in the larger complete version. And in fact, the complete versions of the PTC for term selection are available on the MEDRA website, as well as the JMO, which is Japanese Maintenance Organization website. The JMO is our companion organization that is responsible for maintaining the Japanese language version of MEDRA. Okay. Now, a few more things about the PTC. The PTC will sometimes acknowledge that there's more than one option for selecting terms to code a particular concept. And the PTC will sometimes tell you its preferred option, what it thinks would be the proper one to use. That in fact means that there are alternative ways 
of also coding that. But the PTC sometimes tries to show you the preferred way. It doesn't mean you have to, but this is the ICH endorsed suggestion of how you might want to go about coding. What I would suggest to you is if you do not want to follow the preferred option in the PTC, but choose to use an alternate approach, be consistent in what you do. Don't switch back between preferred some days of the week and your alternate approach other days of the week, because when you go to aggregate that data, you're going to have problems. And then in the back part of the PTC is a section that addresses issues of versioning, as well as how you might time your implementation strategy based on the fact that new versions of Medra come out every six months. So we're going to talk about a few principles that are in this term selection guide. And we'll touch briefly upon them, but these are the major ones, the top level ones that are important for you to have a basic understanding of. If you take the advanced metric coding webinar, we go into the term selection PTC a little bit further and present some more advanced concepts. But the very first one is data quality. And this is so straightforward that if you are collecting information and it's unclear what the reporter is telling you, whether it's a physician or whether it's a patient or whether it's a subject, that is the time to ask enough questions to make sure you are understanding what you're being informed about. Because if you put inaccurate or incorrect or bad information in your database, when you go to pull it out later on, no miraculous transformation will have turned garbage into quality data. So quality data in, leads to the potential for quality analysis. Garbage in, garbage out. So be very careful and meticulous about the design of your data collection forms. Make sure that your staff are trained on how to use those because you want people collecting data for you to know how to fill these forms out because if they don't ask the right questions and don't fill out the form correctly, you're going to have poor quality data. Your data quality standards should be consistent with those that are within the PTC in terms of quality. And also make sure that term selection is reviewed by qualified people. You need to have some review of your coding to make sure you are doing what you say you do in your coding conventions. And even if you use autoencoders, as I said, you need to someone to look over the autoencoder and make sure it's not making mistakes. Another important principle, do not alter metric. It's a standardized terminology with a predetermined hierarchy. The five levels of metric are determined by the MSSO and you will find that as a standardized validated terminology. When you select an LLT in metric for coding purposes, the PT under which it appears, the HLT under which it appears, the HLGT and the SOC are already predetermined. You want to select an LLT which accurately reflects what's in the verbatim, but the rest of the terminology is predetermined by your selection of the proper LLT. Do not make ad hoc changes to the structure of metric. We have a mechanism in place by which you can submit things called change requests to the MSSO if you think that a term needs to be added or if you think that a term is improperly placed in metric. And we're not going to talk about that in any great length here, but there is a change review process. We have video cast on the metric website to familiarize you with how to go about submitting a change request. Now, another important general principle is to always select an LLT and only select current LLTs. So you want to select the LLT that most accurately reflects the verbatim information presented to you. So you got a report that said abscess on face, and you were very, very lazy. You went into measure and you said there's an LLT for abscess, so I'll code with that. And the problem with that is you have left information out of your coding. This told you that there was an abscess and it was on the face. In the same way that you could have an abscess on the face, you could have an abscess in the lung or in the brain or on the skin. 
And the anatomic location may be very, very important, but you were lazy and you just chose the LLT abscess without looking a little bit to find out that there's an LLT in measure called facial abscess, which would have been the most accurate code to have chosen because not only is it capturing the pathologic process, but also the anatomic location. Also remember that we talked about non-current LLTs being LLTs that are flagged in red that you should not use for coding purposes. And so make sure that you do not use LLTs that are non-current. Sometimes companies try to create workarounds for what they perceive to be deficiencies in metric. You should avoid doing that. If you think there's a deficiency in metric, that is the whole purpose of the change request process and what we would encourage you to do. But if you do not find an exact match in Medra at a particular point in time, use your best medical judgment to match it to an existing term. And if in fact you then want to proceed with submitting a change request for something that you think is deficiency in Medra, go ahead and do so. But for the time being, use your best judgment. Now, Select terms for all reported information. I'm in agreement with that because I grew up in a drug reporting environment where we coded not only adverse events and adverse reactions regardless of causal relationship, but we included codes for device related things, product quality issues, medication errors, history, investigations, or indications for use of a drug. And that requires you to be facile in using Metro to know where some of these things might be in terms of specific sites. Now let's do a quick lesson here. This lady's name is Thetis and she is dipping her son in the river Styx. And the myth went that if you submerge someone in this water, that that part of their body was invincible. But you will notice that she is holding her baby by his heel. So he didn't get completely submerged. And her son's name is of course, Achilles, and we talk about the Achilles heel, where you hit Achilles with an arrow and he falls over like a cheap suit. Now, coding also has an Achilles heel. And what is the Achilles heel of coding? It's physicians. And I don't mean any disrespect to my colleagues, but we are the Achilles heel. Because don't blame us, we're trained to make diagnoses. But sometimes the information that is reported to you does not give you a diagnosis. And you don't get to make one, even though you may want to as a physician. So here is an example of why you do not add information. That's an important principle. You have a report of abdominal pain, increased serum amylase, and increased serum lipase. The only LLTs that you should have coded would have been abdominal pain, serum amylase increased, and lipase increased. But in Instead, you have a doctor in your organization who said, oh, that's stupid. All of these things go along with pancreatitis. Let's code this as pancreatitis. The problem with that is the verbatim does not say pancreatitis. And you don't get to code something that's not in the verbatim. There may be a very good reason why that doctor did not code this as pancreatitis. Because even though it has those features, which are often seen in pancreatitis, there may have been a very good reason that the doctor did not choose pancreatitis because they believed that something else was going on. The alternative would be that it absolutely was pancreatitis and the doctor didn't know to put a diagnosis down rather than a list of signs and symptoms, but that may be your fault for not having properly instructed them on how to collect information within your trial or within your study. So don't get into the habit of adding information that was not in a verbatim. Now, just showing you here the topics that are covered in this PTC. You do not have to have an encyclopedic knowledge of each of these things, but what I would like you to walk away with when you look at the PTC index is to understand that it, for instance, has a section on exposures during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So maybe once a year, you'll get a report of a baby who's been exposed to your product through breast milk. And all I want you to remember is that guy, Dave Richardson, said something about breastfeeding in the PTC. 
and that may be the one time of the year you look at the PTC in that section on breastfeeding to give you direction on how you might go about coding that. Piece. Similarly, you may have the one report of suicide or self harm that may have occurred in association with your drug. And it's so infrequent a report for you, you might want to know that the PTC provides guidance on that, along with how to code deaths and other outcomes, and what to do with congenital terms, and what to do about off-label use, et cetera. So just be familiar with what's in the term selection. Okay. Now, I'm going to introduce the browser, but before I do that, I'm going to just ask Sarah if we've gotten any questions from the audience so far put into the chat box. We do. We just have two for the moment. Uh, the first one was, I have a question for LLTs, meaning when worsen and aggravated is not in the dictionary, the related VT. For example, the ulcer worsened. And another example, when we have in the dictionary, unilateral leg pain, but VT tells bilateral leg pain. How do we understand or to add LLTs? So to answer your question about LLTs as they relate to concepts such as worsened and aggravated, going forward, even though some of those terms exist in MEDRA, we do not add worsened and aggravated terms to MEDRA anymore. Because again, that's not within the scope of MEDRA to try to track the aggravation or progression of a disease or a process. In fact, it would burden the terminology by adding thousands of new terms because every condition could presumably worsen or be aggravated. And in fact, if following the progression or aggravation of a condition is important to you, then that goes back to my earlier statement about making sure that you find a classification or terminology that does that for you. Regarding your second question about the fact that sometimes MEDRA doesn't have anything in terms of unilateral or bilateral with, when it relates to anatomic structures, that's because MEDRA cannot do that without having a lot of additional terms, such as left and right for every concept of the body, unless it's important, like the difference between something that happens on the left side of the heart versus the right side of the heart. But the distinction between left leg fracture and right leg fracture is not one that measure will do. And again, if that's important information, then you need to make the best out of what's there. But if you believe there's a glaring omission in terms of a term that should be in measure, submit a change request. And what was the other question, Sarah? You pretty much just answered it. Um, they said, if we would like to propose to add an LLT into MEDRA, whom should we communicate with our proposal? Right, and that would be the WebCR tool. And I will show you at the end, we'll go on the MEDRA website and I'll show you where those tools are. All right, so I wanna now move on and talk about the MEDRA browser. So actually, as you may know, the MEDRA browser comes in three flavors. There is a desktop browser, which is what I'm going to use for my demonstrations today. There's a web-based browser. And a few years back, we created a mobile browser because some of you said you wanted to have the browser at your fingertips with your phone so you could do coding while you were at the beach on vacation. And I just say to you, boy, you never relax, do you? But you, in fact, have three different mechanisms for accessing the Medra browser. Now, let's just talk about some things about the Medra browser in general. It requires a Medra ID and password. It allows you to search and view Medra terms as well as the standardized Medra query. It, it supports all the available languages in Medra. And as I said, that's an increasing number that ultimately with our current plan will top off at somewhere in the low 30s, but again, we will add new languages as appropriate in terms of browser. We also have language specific interfaces to create greater facility so that you have the ability to interact with the product using the language you're most comfortable with. And in the desktop and web-based browser, you have the ability to store or export results either to a research bin or to a local file system. Now, a couple of other things that I don't want to spend a tremendous amount of time on right now, but one of the features of the web-based browser is being able to switch it to a view that allows you to see terms that have been approved for the next version of Medra that's going to come out. And this so-called supplemental view, which is available only in the web-based, 
will allow you to see terms that are planned for the next release of Medra to more or less give you a heads up on what is coming in the future. The other unique features as well about both of those versions, the web-based and the desktop, is you have the ability to see primary and secondary links, to run data against the current list of SMQs. That's covered in the SMQ webinar. And we also have these so-called advanced Boolean search features like contains, not, exact, et cetera, for those of you who are really computer geeks. But what I want to do now is just show you the browser and just do a very quick tour and then move on to the last part of today's presentation, which is to do some practical coding examples. So I want you to browser this way. I've opened it up. It's now in the current version, which is version 26.1 in English. This section on the left contains the Medra hierarchy. And those are the 27 socks listed alphabetically, starting with blood and lymphatics and going down to vascular disorders. The middle part of the browser allows you to type in search terms to see if they actually exist in the metro terminology and where they can be found in the metro terminology. And on the right side is this filter feature that allows you to confine the results that you get to one or more socks when you don't want to see all 27 socks. And anytime you select something in the hierarchy, it's going to provide additional information or details in this lower right-hand panel. So let's start on the left just to begin with. If I am being truthful and the entire hierarchy is here, I said to you that measure had five levels. And so I'm going to click on the blood lymphatic sock, and then it's going to show me the, L, the HLGTs that exist within the blood and lymphatic sock. And in fact, if I select that HLGT for leukemias, it's now going to show me all of the HLTs under that HLGT leukemias. And if I select one of the HLTs, is now showing me all of the PTs that are underneath that particular HLT. And then if I select PTs, it's now showing me LLTs. And I can do that with multiple socks at one time, opening them down to various levels. I've opened this one down to the LLT level, and you'll notice here are some LLTs that are literally in red with a red box around it. And I told you that when we went into the browser, that's how you identify non-current LLTs that you should not be using for coding purposes. So that is what the browser does over on this side. It has the entire hierarchy here. Now, when you are trying to code, remember that you are trying to find an LLT. And there are a couple of ways to find LLTs for coding purposes. The first way is a so-called top-down search, where you believe that you understand what sock an LLT might be found in. And therefore, you want to start at the sock level and drill down trying to find that particular LLT. So suppose you had a case that said the patient had a myocardial infarction. So this time it's not the abbreviation MI, it's myocardial infarction. And you think you want to code that as the LLT myocardial infarction, but you want to first confirm that there is an LLT in Medra for myocardial infarction. You open up cardiac sock, and now you see all these HLGTs. And if I ask you which one of these HLGTs you would expect to find myocardial infarction in, some of you might mistakenly say, oh, I'd look in the HLGT myocardial disorders. But you're not going to find that LLT in that sock. And why is it? It's because you need to know enough medicine to know that a myocardial infarction means that the heart muscle is damaged, not because there's any problem with the myocardium or the muscle, but because the coronary artery that's supposed to supply blood and oxygen has damage to it. And that's how one develops myocardial infarction. 
So if you wanted to look in the right place, you'd look under coronary artery disorders, and it gives you a choice of two HLTs. And you would need to know that a myocardial infarction is an ischemic disorder to select the correct one. And now you begin to go through these and you find here is myocardial infarction as a PT. And then if I open that up, I will see there is an actual LLT for myocardial infarction. And so I've confirmed that myocardial infarction as reported in the verbatim is an actual LLT in Metro. And I did it by doing a top down search. And again, you see our old friend MI, MI here, the abbreviation is ambiguous and therefore it's one of these non-current LLTs. So when you do a top-down search, you are trying to find an LLT that's an exact match for your verbatim. So in fact, if the report said the patient had a myocardial infarct, you'd use myocardial infarct. If it said myocardial infarction, you would use myocardial infarction. So when you have an exact match, if it's in the patient, you would use that LLT heart attack. Match what's in the verbatim. So that is how one goes about which is well where you use the middle panel. And that is where you type in what you think is going to be an LLT in Metra and look to see in the hierarchy if it actually can be found there. So if you had a report where it said the patient had a cluster headache and I type in the words cluster headache and I search, it will tell me, yes, there's an LLT called cluster headache in Medra. So I will know that that is an actual LLT that I could use for coding purposes. And if I select that term and right click, and ask it to go to browser, what it's going to actually do is go into the left panel and show me where cluster headache is. It's right here as an LLT under the PT cluster headache, which is under headaches not elsewhere classified, which is under the HLGT headaches, which is in the nervous system disorder side. And in fact, if the report said the patient had cluster headaches with an S, then I would use that LLT. Now, here's an interesting thing about this. I'm going to collapse the browser on that side and see that I actually, in fact, do not need to type in the entire word. I could just type in plus and head and search. And then would have said to me, yes, you'll find those combination of letters in these five socks in Metro, or five LLTs in Metro. And one of them is cluster headache. So by just using a truncated word, I was able to find that that LLT existed in measure and be able to use that LLT. Now, a couple more things before we get to the coding part. You need to spell correctly. So if I wanted to look up stroke and misspelled it as stork and searched, it's going to tell me I found nothing. And that would make you say, why didn't I find stroke? You need to go up here and see that you misspelled it. So whenever you do not get output, just check to see that you spelled correctly, or this isn't one of those situations of British English spelling versus American English spelling. The other two things that I want you to know about when you are doing these searches is there is something called the synonym list. And the synonym list is an attempt by measure to help in other words, if you start searching for a bleed or a bleeding term, it's also going to, in the output, show you hemorrhage terms because it knows that hemorrhages and bleeds are similar. Similarly, if you put in a seizure term, it's also going to, in the output, show you epileptic and convulsion terms. If you put in a gum term, as in G-U-M, it's going to give you gingival terms. If you put in liver, it's going to give you hepatic terms. So always leave that selected. Now, that's helpful to you in the following sense. Suppose I put in liver failure and I search. The panel is then going to tell me several things. It's going to tell you there's an exact match, liver failure. It's going to tell me there's a lexical variant, which is failure liver, word reversal. 
and you would use whatever LLT accurately reflected what was in the verbatim. It also is telling me there are eight synonyms because the synonym use uh, feature was checked and it's showing me these hepatic terms because I typed in the word liver. And then it's also going to show me 11 other places where the phrase liver failure appears in another measure term, like acute liver failure or acute or chronic liver failure. So that's what the panel in the middle tells me. The second thing I want to show you is this block here, which is the filter feature. Suppose I got a report of ear pain and I just type in the word pain and I search. It's going to tell me there's an LLT for pain. And I will say to you, if you use that for coding, then you haven't done a good job because the report was ear pain. And in fact, there are 655 measure terms that have the word pain in them. But I don't want to search through all 655 trying to find if there's an ear pain concept. And I say to the Medra, I only want to look in the ear and labyrinth disorder sock. And I run my search again, and it now is showing me that there are only seven LLTs that I need to look at, and one of them is ear pain. And so by just having used the filter feature, I've now put down to seven the number of LLTs I had to look for to be able to correctly code a report of ear pain. Now look at what my browser is doing. It lit up a warning here that is telling me, hey guy, guess what? You have a filter on. So if I don't clear that selection, the rest of the day when I'm searching in Medra is only looking in one sock. Now, just one last thing about the Medra browser is that it is important for you to know how to use it. And in fact, if you don't know how to use the Medra browser, you can click here on the user guide, which will take you to this handy dandy guide. It's just all based upon the speed of my connection here, but it's going to show you this guide that you can scroll through, which has exhaustive information on how to use the browser, including screenshots with arrows that will say, click here, don't click here, et cetera, et cetera. So that is another way that you can be helped by the browser. So I'm going to now, clear all of this stuff. And then what I'm going to do is go back to the slides and I'm going to show you several LLTs where you'll see how I go about searching. And then we'll have five at the end that you will try to help me with by trying to code yourself by suggesting some answers. So let's go through the demonstration of coding. And the first thing is to remember, you're getting a report. I'm going to give you just short verbatims in the examples that I use. But the first thing you need to determine is what is it that I'm getting? If, am I being told a clinical condition, an indication for use, a procedure, an injury, a social circumstance? Or sometimes it will be multiple things that are being presented to me. And I will need to use more than one LLT to code what is in a particular verbatim that I receive. But let's start with some examples. This first one, the report says, the patient suffered from an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. I underline the important information here. The patient suffered from an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. I'm going to open up the browser. And I'm going to try to find that allergic reaction to an antibiotic and see if there's an LLT. So I'm going to type in allergic reaction and i'm going to search and it's going to say yes there is a measure llt for allergic reaction which i could choose but i'm a little more curious about these other 21 concepts in measure that have allergic reaction in it and i'm going to open them up and scroll down and start looking through them and some of them are very interesting i start coming up and i see allergic reaction to food allergic reaction to drug. That one sounds great, but I'm not going to stop there. I'll keep going up. And this one says allergic reaction to chemotherapy. And finally, when I get to the top, here's one that says allergic reaction to antibiotics. That is an exact match for what the report was, which that the patient suffered an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. And so by having done this 
bottom-up search, I was able to find possible LLTs and select those. Now, I could, in fact, have done my original search by putting in allergic reaction, anti, and search again, and it would have made it much easier. It would have said allergic reaction to antibiotics, and I would have been able to select that one from the very beginning. So the point of this first example is you're trying to be as specific in your coding as, as possible. You don't want to just say drug reaction because it was an allergic reaction. And you don't want to just say allergic reaction if you can find an LLT for an allergic reaction to an anti. That would be the best choice. Let's move on to the second one. The patient states that she has been experiencing cold sweats, cold sweats. I'll go back to the browser and I'm going to again try this one as a bottom up search and I'm going to type in cold sweats and I search and I get absolutely nothing. And now I'm concerned and I say, well, gee, that might not be a matching measure for, or there isn't a match for cold sweats. So what if I just put sweats in and I search? Now I get two choices, drenching sweats and night sweats. But if I'm correct, or if I'm smart about this, I'm not happy with either one of those because nothing in the verbatim told me that these were drenching sweats and it didn't tell me that they were occurring at night. So this is a unique one where I, I tried exactly what was in there, which was cold sweats, and got absolutely nothing. And then what I would do if I were experienced with what happens if I take the S off of sweats and search, and I find a dead on match, cold sweat. And so even though it does not match verbatim, the fact that sweats was used as a plural noun, I can find a singular noun, and there will be times when you have to add an S in English or remove an S in English from a plural to the singular or vice versa to be able to find a match. So in fact, when you are talking about symptoms in this case, something that a patient subjectively reports, Pay attention to singular versus plural nouns because sometimes you need to make fine adjustments. Now, this one is about investigations. And so it starts out by saying lab results indicate that the patient has an increased troponin and an increased CPKMB. These are two specific enzymes, increased troponin and increased CPKMB. The important thing here is these are two distinct lab results. Some people will say, well, those are cardiac enzymes, but that's not what the report says. It's reporting increases in two specific enzymes. So to do this one, I go again back to the browser, and I'm going to start out with troponin and type that in and search. And it's going to tell me there's a dead on match for troponin, and that's fine, but I'm interested in increased troponin. So I'm going to look at this 29 other term, these 29 other terms, which have troponin in them. And if I scroll through them, I see some that have greater specificity than what was in the verbatim, like troponin I or troponin T. It wasn't in the verbatim. But when I scroll down, I eventually will find one that says, Troponin increase. So even though the word order is different, that's the right concept. And so the first LLT that I would choose is troponin increased. Now, if I go back to the example, there's a second one that I'm trying to code, which is increased CPKMB. So again, I'm going to go back, clear this, and put in CPK and search. And it's going to tell me that there are a bunch there are a bunch of terms here including an exact match but in a bunch of terms that i can look at here including cpk increased but if i select that one i'm missing out on an even better one which was cpk mb increased because that was the specific subtype of cpk that was reported in the original verbatim so i would have two llts for that particular report 
CPK MV increased and troponin increased. And we knew this was investigations because it started out saying lab results and all lab results are in that investigation side. Now this one, medication errors. The patient accidentally took drug Y instead of drug X and became short of breath. Two concepts here that the patient took drug Y instead of drug X. And I don't expect to find drug Y in drug X in Medra, but I do expect to find some concept in Medra related to taking the wrong drug. And the other thing I need is an LLT for short of breath. So let me start with the low hanging fruit first and put in short of breath and search and I get a dead on verbatim for short of breath. So that's one of the LLTs that I would have selected. But the other one was taking drug Y instead of drug X. That's gonna be very, very hard for me to do as a bottom up search, because I'm gonna to have to figure out exactly what words Medra used to describe that. And because this is a medication error that we're talking about, one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is sometimes a top-down strategy is the better strategy for certain kinds of concepts, and medication errors is one of them. So I'm trying to find the right medication error term for taking drug Y instead of drug X, and the best way for me to do that is a top-down. And so I, first of all, need to know where the medication errors are in Medra. And they're in this sock for injury, poisoning, and procedural complications. When I open that up, I'll get these HLGTs. And one of them is an HLGT for medication errors and other product use errors and issues. And I will open that one up. And now I will see these various kinds of HLTs that exist. And this particular problem was one of administration of a drug. So this is a product administration error or issue. And I will select that one and get a bunch of PPTs. And then I have to be patient and scroll through until I find one that I think is a good match of the medical concept. And in this particular case, I have to get to the very last one, which was wrong product administered. And I select that PT. And when I get there, there's even greater specificity because we have an LLT not only for wrong product administered, but we have one for wrong drug administered. And in fact, those two, wrong drug administered and short of breath is the right combination of LLTs for that, verbat for that verbatim that I received. And we did one with a top down, but because medication errors are best searched by doing a a, uh, excuse me, by a top-down search, that's why we look for that medication error concept here, whereas short of breath we did as a bottom-up, okay? So let's go back now to our slides. Move on to example five. A two-day-old baby was noted to have a mild fever, and they weren't happy about it apparently because you heard him crying. So now what I'm going to do is close all this up and start all over again. And I'm going to type in fever. And if I type in fever, I'm going to see that there is a dead on match for fever. But remember, I tried to help you by underlining the things that are important here. And in this particular case, I also underlined baby because the fact that this baby had a fever is important because that's a vulnerable population. And here is where your synonym list helps you because you are wondering, is there a fever concept in Medra related to newborns? And when I search, it tells me there is a term for fever neonatal. And the synonym list has helped me because it has used as synonyms neonatal and newborn. So even though I typed in newborn, it tells me that the permissible LLT that's in Medra, fever neonatal. Now, I could have found that if I just looked under fever and searched, but that would have involved me having to go through 
191 terms until eventually I came across fever neonatal. So by having used it as a term in the search box itself, it cut the amount of work that I needed to do. All right, so don't forget about those important demographic groups. Moving on, a 35-year-old woman was taking drug X to prevent relapses of multiple sclerosis. 35-year-old woman was taking drug X to prevent relapses of multiple sclerosis. So now I go to the browser and I type in the beginnings of the word multiple sclerosis and I search. And it tells me that those truncated words are found in 26 terms. And here is one for multiple sclerosis. Now, why can't I just code this as multiple sclerosis? Well, I need to go back and look at the verbatim because remember what it was actually telling me, that the indication for the use of the drug was prevention of relapses of multiple sclerosis. So in fact, if I now go back to my list here, and begin to scroll through, I'm actually going to term here that will be very, very interesting for me to consider using, which is multiple sclerosis relapse prophylaxis. That's exactly the indication for why the patient was taking the drug, to prevent relapses of multiple sclerosis. So I had to look a little deeper and look for that prophylaxis term, but it's in there. Now, this is a subtlety as well. I would use that to code the fact that the patient was taking the drug to prevent relapses, but I might also use the actual multiple sclerosis LLT in a second place, which would be as a medical history term. So the patient has a medical history of MS, but also has a history of taking a drug for prophylaxis against relapses. And that would be a second term that would relate to the indication for use of the drug. So important, depending upon your coding conventions, that you would use both of those terms because they're both relevant. All right, let's go back now to our slides. She had a pathologic fracture of the neck of the left femur a pathologic fracture of the neck of the left femur. This one is very, very subtle. And here's how I want to go about. Suppose I put in femoral fracture. It is going to tell me that I have these choices available. And when I look through there, I see one that I'm gravitating toward, which is fractured femoral neck. Okay, that's fine, but except there's something else that the verbatim told me, which was that it was a pathologic fracture. What is a pathologic fracture? It's a fracture that occurs at a point in the bone where the bone is weakened. For instance, it may be the bone is weakened because there's a metastatic cancerous lesion right there in the femur. And it was a pathologic fracture because that was a vulnerable site. But in fact, because I put this in as femoral fracture, I never had an opportunity to see if Medra had a concept related to the fact that it was pathologic. So this is an example where I'm going to redo this and follow this as sometimes less is more. Rather than typing out the word femoral, I'm going to type in fem and fracture. And let's see what I get. I'm going to get a bunch of new terms, but some of them are going to be femoral and some are going to be femur. And so when I start to scroll through those, I'm going to see femur terms and I'm going to see femoral terms. And eventually when I get down into the P's, I'm going to have a pathologic fracture of neck of femur. And that's the perfect term. The only thing that is missing is it doesn't say left leg, but measure's not going to have a left leg and right leg term. So that's as good as it's going to get. But in fact, if I had put down fem, fracture, and path and searched, 
it would immediately have taken me to three choices, one of which was non-current, and I would have landed on not pathologic fracture of femur, but pathologic fracture of neck of femur. So more specificity as we went down. So let me clear that. We'll go on to the next example. Following the procedure, the patient experienced several days of constipation. Again, we're under the theme of specificity. I'm gonna type in constipation, if I spell correctly, constipation. I'm going to search. I'm going to get a dead on match, but this was, I was told this happened after a procedure. And by scrolling through, I do find a post-procedural constipation term, which is the right term for me to have selected there. So whenever it says something happened after surgery or after a procedure or post-procedurally, look to see if there is a qualifying term in measure for the fact that it was surgically related, because the more specificity, the better you're going to be in analysis. So that one was straightforward, but again, highlighting specificity. Let's move on. Number nine. Death and other patient outcomes. The 66-year-old man died from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. He died from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. I'm going to type in aortic aneurysm and beginning of, let me just start with that, aortic aneurysm. It's going to tell me there are 52 terms to look for. And when I look through those 52 terms, one of the very first I come to is aortic aneurysm rupture. Perfect. It is absolutely what was described here. Word order is a little different, but it's still the same concept. However, some of you are asking, but aren't you going to code the fact that the man died? And the answer is no, because death is not typically coded. It's not an adverse event. It's an outcome. And we'll say more about this in advanced coding, but I want you to just understand that there are only, there are rare circumstances where you would code death. But most times death, just like hospitalizations and disabilities are outcomes that you would create another data collection field within Medra to be able, or excuse me, within your data collection instrument to capture that outcome. So that's why we only captured the ruptured aortic aneurysm. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the ones that I'm going to demonstrate for you, and, and you'll have a chance to amaze me with your coding skills. This is a product quality issue. <clears throat> it was determined that the product was counterfeit. It was determined that the product was counterfeit. I'm going to now go here and say, first of all, if I look through the 27 socks, which sock do you think I should be looking in for this counterfeit product? And this will be one where I need to have a little familiarity, but eventually I'll say, this is an issue with the product. And when I click on it, I have two choices, device related or product quality, supply, distribution, manufacturing, and quality system issues. Well, it didn't say it was a device, so I'll go with product. And right out the gate, it has counterfeit, falsified, and substandard products as an HLT. And underneath that is product counterfeit and underneath that PT is product counterfeit, which is the LLT that I should be using. So that one is fairly straightforward, but it was best done by a top-down search and you needed to know that this was a product issue to know which sock to look in. Now, let's move on. Next one, the patient was confined to a wheelchair, confined to a wheelchair. Well, I don't know where to search for this one. So what I'm gonna start out by doing is just type in wheelchair. And when I search, it's gonna tell me wheelchair user. And that is a good match. And in fact, the only term in measure that has the word wheelchair in it. But what I want you to appreciate is where this term lives. When I ask the browser, where is wheelchair user? It's under the concept of wheelchair user, which is in this sock called social circumstances. So in fact, if you were looking for people that had specific disabilities, 
if you don't look in this social circumstances sock, because it's one of those three socks that I told you was non-multi-axial, the other one was investigations and the other one was surgical and medical procedures, that's the only place you're going to find that particular PT, wheelchair user in metro. But also look at the other important concepts like artificial height heart device user. If you don't look in this sock, you're going to miss these cases of people that have cardiac disease if you are searching your database for cardiac disease. So understand that this is why you need to look thoroughly in some of these other socks that you never give much thought to. All right, the last one of examples that I'm going to actually go through with you is this one which is a medication error issue. The pharmacist made a mistake in compounding the medication. Compounding error in making the medication. Remember what I said previously, this is a medication error. You are best served by trying to do this as a top down. And you remember from before that's in the SOC injury poisoning and procedural complications. This is a medication error and I'll call it, I'll select that HLGT. But what kind of error is it? It's a product preparation error. The product, the error was in the preparation of the product by the pharmacist. And so in fact, it's a product preparation error as a concept. And when I look underneath that, it now tells me one of the choices is product compounding error. And that's the one that I like. And that's what I'm going to select. Okay, so let's close that up. I'm gonna ask you to open the browser because we're now going to go through some examples that you're going to do some coding with. Let's just finish by pointing out that I gave you little short vignettes there. Most of the time your verbatim is going to be several lines long. And here's an example where I've underlined the concepts in this particular narrative that you should be coding. A 75-year-old man receiving drug X for rheumatoid arthritis. You're coding rheumatoid arthritis because it's the indication for use of the drug. Develops symptomatic aortic valve stenosis. You code that because it's an adverse event. The patient's medical history is significant for colon cancer and cigarette smoking. You code those concepts because they're medical history. The patient underwent a aortic valve replacement. You code that because it's a surgical procedure. And the patient developed a sternal wound fracture three days post-surgery. You code the fact that the patient had a post-surgical wound infection because it is an adverse event related to the procedure that they underwent. We don't need to go through each one of those to select a specific LLT, but just remember, based on your coding conventions, there may be a lot of different things that you would code in a narrative above and beyond adverse events. Now, having said that, let's move on. I'm top. I've been doing all the heavy lifting. So now it's time for you to take your final exam. And we're going to use poll EV for this. So what I want you to do is open up the browser, either the desktop version or the web-based browser. I'm going to provide you with five short vignettes or verbatims that I want you to select an LLT for. I want you to go in the browser and select an actual LLT out of Nedra, and you're going to use Poll EV to submit that, and we'll take a look and see what the group thinks would be the best LLT to have selected. So again, two ways to get in there. Do a browser on your computer or cell phone, type in pollev.com, type in this username, join, skip over the next screen. Or again, here is the Poll Everywhere CR code. I'll give you a few minutes to be able to scan that if you hadn't done so previously. And then we'll go on to having you finish up by doing five coding exercises for me. Give you another 10 seconds or so, because I know you folks that use these QR codes, you whip out your phone in a second. Okay, very first one. She was diagnosed with pneumonia caused by COVID-19 infection. She was diagnosed with pneumonia caused by COVID-19 infection. 
what do you think is the right one to have selected? Start typing in your responses. Now I'm going to not let you see the responses as they come in because what happens is if you see other responses, once you see what someone and then you see a lot of people saying the same thing, then people tend to select them by saying, oh, that's probably the right answer. But let's look at the responses that are coming in. COVID-19 pneumonia, excuse me, hold on, got a little ahead of myself. COVID-19 pneumonia, COVID-19 pneumonia. Third time. Am I COVID related? Don't know where that one came from. COVID-19 pneumonia. COVID-19, okay. So you've got the hang of it. You looked in there and you said, can I find a combination term that encompasses not only that the patient had a COVID-19 infection, but that it caused a pneumonia. So this person here who said COVID-19 infection missed out on the fact that there was a unifying term, not only for the infection, but for the pneumonia. And so for this particular case, and at this point, I'm going to clear the responses and move on to the answer, which was COVID-19. So if you got that one, give yourself a pat on the back. Okay, let's move on to number two. The woman ingested her husband's blood pressure meth, blood pressure drug by mistake. The woman ingested her husband's blood pressure drug by mistake. Now this has all the trappings of an error that was made. It says by mistake, so a medication error. So that'll give you a hint as to whether you should be trying to do a top-down or bottom-up search on this particular one. And I'm going to, again, <coughs> block out the responses until you have a chance to put some in, and then we're going to look and see what kind of answers the group is recommending here. Let's look at responses. Okay. I wanted to clear that one. Let's go again, please. Now, some of you are typing in responses that are not actual MEDRA LLTs. And that's not going to be very helpful to you if you don't realize that the only LLTs you can use are actual LLTs that are within MEDRA. Well, so let's see if in the interest of time, we can help you out with this one. I'm gonna go back to the browser. So again, this is a problem here with an accidental administration of drug. So suppose I type in the beginning of accidental and drug and see what that gets me. One of the concepts that I find when I look at these nine, this one says child, well, this was a woman. Exposure is a little vague because it doesn't really help me. We can expose ourselves by a number of different routes that don't actually involve ingesting a product. This one is vaccine drug interaction. Multiple drug overdose is not relevant. This is non-current. This is talking about drug overdose, but the verbatim doesn't say anything about this being an overdose, just that the woman took the wrong drug. And this one is multiple drugs again. So in fact, the actual best choice here is accidental ingestion of drug. And where does that live? It lives under the PT, accidental exposure to product, which is under that, this HLT, which is under this HLGT, which is in the injury sock. And again, it was medication error. So we could go at it the other way, which was you would have started out with injury poisoning and procedural complications. You then would have said, okay, it's a medication error. 
And in fact, when I looked at the HLTs, the correct one is an accidental exposure to a product. And under that, it would be which of these choices? Accidental exposure to product. And then more specifically, accidental ingestion of drug. So that one was a little difficult. But again, why it's so difficult to do bottom-up searches for meditation error concepts. All right, we're getting close to our finish time. So let's go through these last couple ones. We'll move on to the next one. The patient developed hyponatremia while hospitalized. The patient developed hyponatremia while hospitalized. I want you to pay attention to two things there. The spelling of the word hyponatremia and the spelling of the word hospitalized. And please begin to enter your responses. And let's see what we've got. Hospital acquired hyponatremia. Hospital acquired hyponatremia. Hypo okay, so this is subtle, but notice that some of you said hospital acquired hyponatremia spelled with American English, and some of you at selected hospital acquired hyponatremia with British English. Which one is the correct answer? Well, in order to figure that out, you have to go back to the original question, which is why I said to you, attention to the spelling. This was British English, and you would know that because hospitalized was spelled with an S rather than with a Z. So, in fact, the correct answer here is hospital acquired hyponatremia with the British spelling. Subtle but important. Nurse noticed that the injection solution had an unusual odor. The nurse noticed that the injection solution had an unusual odor. I'm going to clear responses and allow you to start answering and putting in responses. The nurse noticed that unusual odor. And I'll go back once again and show you the question. The injection solution had an unusual odor. Okay, let's see what kind of responses I'm getting. Product odor <coughs> abnormal. Sorry. Product odor abnormal. Okay. Device emits odor. That's just a pure presumption on whoever's part that was that this was a device because the verbatim didn't tell you that. The correct answer is actually product odor abnormal. We didn't have a term for unusual. Abnormal was the best we could get, but also pay attention as well to spelling because if this had been British English with a U in odor, then you would have to have selected that as the proper term for coding purposes. Okay, we have one last one that we're going to do. So it's product odor abnormal. The last one for you to do is this one. The elderly woman complained her arm was tender where she had received her seasonal flu vaccine. The elderly woman complained her arm was tender where she had received her seasonal flu vaccine. All right. Let me okay. I'm sorry, this mouse is very skittish today. Let's see what we get.
application site tenderness. Well, she didn't have anything applied. She asked, she had patient. Pain injection site. She didn't actually report pain, she reported tenderness. So now we have injection site tenderness, but probably all of you will agree that the best combination of the fact that she had tenderness and then it was after a vaccine was vaccination site tenderness. It's more specific than injection site and more specific in terms of characterizing this as tenderness rather than pain because that's what was in the verb here. So vaccination site tenderness. Okay, so we have basically covered what we were supposed to get through. And I'm sure all of you have a 10019211, which is the metric term for heading. But let's just summarize what we did. We discussed the scope, structure, and characteristics of metro. We discussed coding conventions. We looked at, in some detail, the term selection points to consider document. And again, as I said, if you take the advanced coding webinar, we delve into that document in even greater detail. Then we talked about the browser. And I showed you how it could be used for coding, not only with top-down, but bottom-up searches as well. I demonstrated some coding exercises for you and how I arrived at LLTs. And then you went to head of the class and you did the same thing with five examples that I gave. Now, again, for those of you who are brand new with the browser and measure today, this may have gone by you too quickly because you were not that adept in moving in the browser, but that's what's going to happen in the beginning. And the more you use the browser, the better you will become at using the browser. This is practice. I offer my own personal opinion that if you have not used Medra at all, you use, need to use it on a fairly consistent basis for probably a year or more before you'll get to a point where you'll say, I'm comfortable with Medra. And that's just reality that taking this webinar today is not going to make you the head of your coding department tomorrow despite your great hopes and aspirations. So just some follow-up information here at the end. This is the Metro website, the email for the help desk. We also have on the website a link to frequently asked questions and not only the questions, but the answers. Here are the URL, <coughs> excuse me, the URLs for the three browsers. This is how you submit a change request and I'll show you that on the Metro website. You obviously know how to access the training schedule because you sign up for this webinar. And this is where the support documentation is. And in fact, what I'm going to do here is to go here to the Medra website and show you a few things here that I think are important, which is if you want to find some of these tools like WebCR, you would go under how to use and tools, and that will take you to this screen here where you could use that to help you submit a change request, which would involve clicking here for WebCR, and it's going to take you through the whole process of how to do that. So that's how you do it. And then again, going back to the home page, if you go under support documentation, it's going to take you to this page and would go under this blue tab here to find that points to consider document that we talked about. And I'll open it up right here. And that's what it looks like. And like I said, it's 67 pages long. It's a very good read, not that onerous, and it has a lot of valuable information in it. Okay, so at this point, to stop, I'm gonna ask Sarah, do I have any additional questions from the audience? Yes, uh, we have a few. Uh, one was, Relating back to our questions from earlier, she says, again, I'm very coding reviewer at my company. Still, I ask about worsened or aggravated events. Why? Because, for example, we have an event ongoing and being worsened. Then how will you code with LLT? And again, I'll just reiterate the point. If you have an event occur and each time you see that patient or subject and they say the problem has gotten worse, Medra is not designed to help you track the worsening of clinical conditions. It simply will allow you to code the existence of the condition. And if, 
it particularly is a serious condition like let's say a neurodegenerative disorder that progresses or a cancer, there will be other scales, classifications, et cetera, that one uses to try to track the progression of something going from a stage three to a stage four, et cetera. So you're asking Medra to do something that it can't do for you. Because even if we were to add worsening terms for everything that's in Medra, it's all relative. The next time when they come in and they say it's worse, now you'll put worsened whatever the condition was. It doesn't tell you quantitatively how much worse it was from the prior visit. So you're trying to get the terminology to do something that's not really designed to do, and you'll have to find another alternative for that kind of tracking of progression. So I hope that answers the question. Other questions? Um, what will you code if VT pain due to fall? Not going to help you with specific coding questions, as I said in the beginning. The bottom line is, is that VT, for instance, is an abbreviation. I have no idea what that means in the context of the report that you've received. It may be something you're very familiar with because of the nature of your product or the class of drug or whatever, but that's the context that you as the owner of that drug have that I don't to make a correct decision about how to code that. Because again, your coding conventions that your organization uses may differ from the PTC. So if I'm gonna give you a response based on the PTC, but your organization does something that's an alternate, then that's not gonna be very helpful for you. And that's why I stay away from trying to answer those kinds of questions. You have your product, you have the label, you have your coding conventions, you know the regulatory environment in which you are working. You have the best context to be able to select the right LLT. The PTC is designed to help you with principles to select the best LLT in that context. Perfect. Other questions? Um, what is the difference between a product and drug in MEDRA terms? So for example, between accidental ingestion of drug and accidental ingestion of product. So the product term is the broader concept. If you think about it, when you say product, what could that mean? It could mean drug, it could be vaccine, it could mean biologic, it could mean drug device. Now, one of the problems as well is if we try to have a measure term for every type of product, then we add thousands and thousands of terms to measure that eventually come to a point where it makes it so onerous that you might have problems with servers not being able to accommodate something that large. So in point of fact, we could have a term that says drug smells bad, biologic smells bad, vaccine smells bad. And a lot of times what we do is to be more pragmatic and under the umbrella, we would say product smells bad. We can't put an infinite number of terms in measure, so we have to pick our battles where specificity really adds something. So we are using more the product concepts than we have in the past, especially as new types of products continue to be developed that are out of the realm of what was the old days when it was you took a drug we didn't even have the concept of a biologic until the last several decades so just think about that as well okay other questions uh would you use coding to clarify elements listed in the medical history as well you can and that depends upon your coding conventions if you decide you want to capture medical history the question becomes, how are you gonna capture those events? And my suggestion to you would be that MEDRA is a very good terminology in terms of indications for use of a drug. And it may be that there is a regulatory requirement that you fill out a field called indications for use of a drug, and we therefore need to use a MEDRA term if that is what the regulator is expecting you to do. Other questions? That was it, that concludes all of them. All right, so I want to thank each and every one of you for your time and participation in today's webinar. I hope that you found it to be valuable. We ran a little bit over, so anybody who wants to listen to it again, you always have the benefit of using the um, recording that we have. And the other point of this as well is, if you're new to coding, 
listening to this or some other recording in the future when you get a little more time working with Medra under your belt may help you to grab onto and understand some of the information I presented today that may have gone right over your head. But you need to spend as much time as possible in the terminology, and that's how you become very good with using the terminology. Anything else coming at the last minute? One did, but it is relating back to that VT. It says, how do you believe incoming more and more VT? Again, I cannot help you with that specific coding question. And that's it. All right. Well, I want to thank Sarah as well for helping me out today. And um, I would encourage you to take additional webinars in your areas of interest or areas in which you need more training. Also be on the lookout for our face-to-face -face courses. We are expanding those offerings now that we are in a different phase of the COVID um, situation. So be aware that we are now conducting face-to-face um, -face courses in a number of locations. And I wanna thank you for your time and attention today. This is Dr. Dave Richardson, and I'm signing off from today's webinar.